Hi, I'm Ella Pyman and you're here at the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Today we are joined by Dr. David Barusta, a Senior Research Fellow at the National Security College at the ANU. Um, he is joining us tonight for a, a presentation on India and China in the Indian Ocean, a contest of status and legitimacy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So now, Dr. Um, Brewster, I'd love to ask you my first question. I wondered if you could briefly outline the key interests um, in the Indian Ocean between um, India and China. Do you think it's safe to say that there's an overriding interest in either economic or security terms? Well, the two countries have very different interests, and that's partly sort of the, I suppose, the cause of the, some of the underlying competition. Um, India has an overriding interest in the region uh, to be seen as the leading power in the region. Um, uh, ultimately, it has aspirations to be the leading economic force in the region and the leading military power. And underlying this is probably a view that um, as part of India's aspirations to become a great world power, it requires a, a part of the globe where it is seen as predominant. In the olden days, some might have called it a sphere of influence. I'm not sure whether that term is really applicable here, but certainly an area where it is seen as the predominant power. Now, on the other hand, uh, China has very different interests in the region. China uh, is uh, uh, long been a continental power on the Eurasian continent with its uh, only coastline on the Pacific. And its rise as a great economic force has uh, increased its uh, trading requirements, both in terms of imports and exports. Um, and in fact, it receives uh, virtually all or, or a major part of its energy imports across the Indian Ocean from both the Persian Gulf and the uh, West Africa. And uh, a large portion of its exports uh, across the Indian Ocean. So that means that the uh, the trading routes that cross the Indian Ocean are absolutely crucial for China. In addition to this, uh, at least over the last uh, 10 years or so, it's starting to, to gain um, significant economic and investment interests in the region, and that's being reinforced by the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is creating a series of new pathways to the Indian Ocean and um, as part of that, uh, the, you know, it, it has plans to develop strong economic interests all around the Indian Ocean. So two uh, very important interests for, for both countries, but very different. And I guess that need, leads nicely into my next question. Um, it's often referred to in the media as China's string of pearls, which is their increased investment in you know, ports in this area. Um, so how is India responding to China's increased investments, um, which have been described as an encirclement of India? Um, how do they view this strategy? Yeah. Look, um, the string of pearls theory, which was that China was building these ports to uh, be used as uh, naval bases and somehow encircle India, was sort of wrong but sort of right has been proved sort of wrong and sort of right. Raja Mohan is absolutely correct in saying uh, that uh, in strategic terms, bases are the name of the game in the Indian Ocean. And China is certainly seeking naval and air bases in the region in the long term. Um, they, these bases aren't going to be the places that were identified as part of the string of pearls such as Hamban Tota or Chittagong. Um, those ports that were developed with Chinese money don't actually make great naval bases. So, but nevertheless, China needs um, bases of one form or another in the region, and it's gradually developing them. 
Uh, in la last December, it announced that uh, it was going to be developing uh, naval logistics facilities in Djibouti, uh, which is really the China's first foreign military base. So that's uh, crossing a huge Rubicon for China in sort of ideological terms. Previously, it was only you know foreign uh, Western imperialists who would have, have military bases, yeah. and China would never have a military base. Well, they're, they're you know they're opening what they what they call a logistics facility. It's a military base. That's what military bases do, um, and it's uh, as part of that. It's not just a port. It's also a, a an airfield, and that's just as important. Uh, India is also developing. Uh, sorry, China is also developing um, facilities at Gwadar, which could be very useful as a uh, logistics facility. And in coming years, we will see other uh, facilities developed around the region. Why? Why do they need them? Because to the extent that the Chinese Navy is going to be uh, more or less permanently deployed in the Indian Ocean, they need logistical support. And perhaps if there was a conflict, they would need um, uh, more than logistical support. Also, uh, just as important as the as the the naval element are the air bases, which uh, we will see developed uh, around the region, and I expect uh, we'll see some Chinese facilities in in, in East Africa. The Indians are being just as active and. Um, again, they have overcome their squeamishness about um, foreign military bases, which they long decried while they were um, part of the, uh, as part of the non-alignment movement. Foreign military bases are only something that, that uh, superpowers have. Uh, India is in the process of developing a naval base on an island, uh, Assumption Island in the Seychelles. And it's likely that they will also develop facilities on the Agalega Islands in uh, Mauritius and also on their own islands on Indian territory in the Andaman Islands near the Malacca Strait. Now you see these places spread out all over the Indian Ocean. That is to extend the reach of in the India's Navy, provide them with support, but just as importantly to provide for maritime surveillance. So maritime surveillance can use all these places right. and surveil the, uh, the whole of the Indian Ocean. So yes, we're seeing a, a bit of a base game. I call it um, playing a game of Go. If you know that, um, that game, it's uh, sort of the Chinese equivalent of chess. It's where you have little markers and you mm. put them down on a board and you try and capture as much territory as you can. And the key to the game is, uh, the, the end game is determined why, by where you put your markers at the very beginning. And that's a very similar um, situation to what we're seeing. Both India and China are playing a long game in the Indian Ocean and they're, they're looking out for places to, where, to put their markers at the beginning of the game. Right. So we're very much at the beginning of the game then. That's right. Yes. So in the long term, do you think it's possible that this um, area could end up more like the South China Sea and that would see more military build up um, and more strategic imperatives taking place? Well, certainly I see greater strategic competition in the Indian Ocean than we've seen in previous decades. It will be very, very different from the South China Sea because the issues are different. We're not talking about um, uh, uh, fights about um, maritime territory. Rather, we're talking about um, uh, issues of protection of trade routes across a very long um, uh, um, uh, uh, spaces. So, and at the same time, as India and China are sort of starting to jostle up against each other, they both assume that, at least in the medium to, or to long run, that the U.S. presence will decrease. Um, you know, we've had the benefit of U.S. Uh, naval predominance there for around 40 years or 50 years. We, in coming years, will see that gradually decrease mm. as their reliance on 
oil imports from the Persian Gulf decreases. The US is now energy independent. Um, and as the US presence decreases, then you know, potentially it creates a, a bit of a vacuum and India and China will both be eager to fill that, uh, that space. Which is very interesting because we have seen India reaching out to the US um, Japan and Australia, which is, you know, very much shifting away from that non-alignment, that traditional strategy that they've been following throughout the Cold War and even more recently. Um, so does, what does this symbolise for Indian foreign policy? Is it as something that's homegrown, more of an organic transformation of their foreign policy, or is it something that's been um, initiated by the increased presence of China? Yeah, well, both. Both. I mean, it's a huge change, and we shouldn't under, underestimate how much of a change it is and it's driven the most immediate driver is of course China um, and India's realization that it is not strong enough to balance against China by itself and it it absolutely needs US presence in the region in the Indo-Pacific region and the presence and the strength of US allies to uh, to balance India. So that's the most immediate driver. But underneath that is really a, a transformation in Indian foreign policy as it moves from its a traditional uh, non-aligned uh, uh, rhetoric and posture, which was really driven by defensiveness and weakness. It was a, India was a weak state and it uh, sought to create space for itself through non-alignment. Now, as India grows, it becomes a much stronger economic power um, and it rises through the ranks and becomes a force in managing the international system. Then it realises that it has to become much more interdependent with other countries, including the United States, including Australia and Japan, and that in that it will gain influence through working with other countries and through interdependence rather than uh, in spite of other countries. So it's a very, very different way of looking at the world from the yeah. defensive to the uh, part of you know, managing the system. Well, thank you, Dr. Brewster. It's been very interesting and you'll have to continue to watch this space because there's clearly lots of developments to come. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much.